For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. On Christmas morning, the Lord God, who once came from heaven to earth so that we might know more of the love of God, on this Christmas morning, this God called one of his faithful servants home from earth to heaven. So that having known and loved God faithfully in this life, Eugene Alhart might know and abide in the love even more fully in the life to come and for all eternity. This happened only 10 days after Jean's brother Richard passed on. Last week, a few days ago, members of Eugene's immediate family gathered to say their farewells at Whitehaven Memorial Park. But today, our attention shifts from death to life. Today, a larger number of us gather to join our voices with the choir of heavenly hosts singing, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. But we will not be so heavenly minded in this time now that we neglect to give thanks for the full life, the full measure of life Jean lived here on this earth. Today, we celebrate a life well lived a life lived as well as anyone could live it. Today we gather to give thanks to God for a man of faith, hope, and love. Welcome to Trinity Reformed Church. I am Richard Otterness, Jean's pastor. And we are gathered as family and friends who knew and loved Jean Alhard and were known and loved by him or as friends of family members. And you are welcome here. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As crowded as we are in this place today, and we are, there are folks uh, participating in this service via monitor in the fellowship hall in addition to those of us gathered in this room. Now, it's appropriate that we gather in this place for while there are a number of people who share the responsibility, no one was more responsible for this particular church being in this particular place than Eugene Alhart. So as we gather in this place today, we are going to remember him in several ways. Focusing on his life as an example, focusing on his faith, the life of faith, and on sowing the seeds of God's love. As we do this, we will read and hear some favorite passages of scripture. We will hear some meaningful and sometimes some whimsical words Gene himself wrote in his journal journals over the years. And we will sing some of the songs he spent a lifetime singing and teaching others. At the end of the rows of seating, at least every other row of seats, there should be a sheet from a visitor's book, guest book, like this. I'll tell you what to do with it in a moment. But first, let me show you this guest book. This guest book comes from Jean and Lois's home. It's been around for a while. The first date signed is February 1st, 1952. And when Jean and Lois had company over to the house, Jean would invite them to sign in the guest book, but under the column where there's space for remarks, he would invite people to leave just a, a Bible reference, the reference of a favorite verse or passage, if they had one. We're going to do, ask you to do that as well today. If you would now, if you're on a center aisle and can find a sheet like this, they are in every other row. Uh, should be in seating here and there and in the fellowship hall as well. If you'd sign your name on this sheet, and if you have a favorite reference of a passage you'd like to make notation of, please do that. If doesn't, one, one doesn't come to mind, that's fine too. We are glad you're here, 
and this will be a remembrance for the family of your presence with them today. <clears throat> the passages which Jean's grandchildren will be reading come from this old red family guest book. <coughs> You'll not only hear the passages, but also the name of the person who recorded it in this book. And then the readings from his journal. They will speak for themselves. It seems a wonderful gift Gene left us, that instead of just talking about him today, we might hear from him directly, even now. Finally, the songs that we will sing have been chosen by family members as a sampling of songs Jean sang and taught over the decades, whether it be amongst the smallest children in Bible school or with teenagers at a Christian Endeavor youth retreat or at one of the weekly services he and Lois would conduct amongst the elderly even until recently. So whether you're in the sanctuary or in the fellowship hall, we invite you to join in the singing of these songs, which meant a lot to Gene over the years. These are the ways we will remember him today. Let us begin in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the resurrection and the life. We worship you, we praise your holy name. May this time we share be blessed by you, that in giving thanks for your servant Eugene, we may be lifted above our own deep sense of loss into the light and peace of your presence among us. May the same Holy Spirit, which so animated Jean's life over the years, fill us with joy and hope in believing that what we do in this place today would be good and pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I would ask that you'd continue passing those sheets and sign them until everyone's had a chance and a few behind it. <laughs> My mom remembers that him. This is my father's world as one of my grandpa's favorites. One of my favorite memories of my grandpa is from a year ago, <coughs> September, when he stood right here and gave the final blessing at my wedding ceremony. 
It was such a special moment for me, and I want this to be a special moment for him. So I've chosen to read a passage that was one of his favorites, and that reflects the way he lived his life according to God's word. He has showed me, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.32 was a favorite verse of a Christian Endeavor friend of my grandfather's, Russell Gowdy. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. I can understand how this was also one of my grandfather's favorite verses, because he lived it. He always looked at the good in others. And because of this kind of support, I know that I will receive strength every time that I think of him. I'm not sure anybody really knows why Grandma and Grandpa bought the house at 226 Inwood Drive 40-some years ago. Um, we're really not sure if it was because they would foresee all the, the joy and happiness family gatherings or if it was because, coincidentally, it was the number of Grandpa's favorite verse. I have fond memories of my grandfather who, of many things, taught me to bowl, and it also coincides with his, his high game of 226. It's Pro Proverbs 226 is what we call it in our family. Train up a child in a way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I think if anybody knows my mother and my two uncles, it's an evidence that my grandparents believed in this passage deeply. Proverbs 226, the new version. Teach a child how he should live, and he will remember it all of his life. My dad taught by example. As the family prepared for today, we found a wealth of material written in his own words. And we think you will know our dad even better if we use his words along with ours. In the year 1955, I started writing in a little book which I call my Quiet Hour Book. In the left-hand drawer of my desk, I have a clock operated by a push switch. I begin and end the quiet hour by pushing the switch. At the end of each month, I check the clock and record the quiet hour time. The clock is then reset for the next month. Forty years of quiet hours have produced many sermons, poems, and stories. As weak as he was just a few days ago, he was still trying to work on his sermon for the Arbor Hill nursing home, and I found his notes. Typing was a little crooked, but his thoughts were clear. The Bible was God's Christmas catalog, but the specials were not dated. All the gifts were already paid for. An example of discipline, an example of devotion. Example as a husband, his love for my mother, his muzzy, as he called her, was expressed with many poems, and you can see that that's why I printed them in the insert instead of trying to read them today. I chose a couple that I think are especially meaningful. As a witness for Jesus, church, Christian endeavor, lay preaching, Sunday school, not enough for my dad. He had to join the Gideons back in 1973. He recalls one of his many experiences like this. Riding in a plane as I was returning from a CE meeting in Columbus, a young lady was asleep next to me. I felt the Holy Spirit urging me to witness to her. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Opening my little Gideon New Testament, at random, I read Psalm 89, verse 1 and 2. As she opened her eyes, I said, look what I read. I am to declare God's love from one generation to another. And look, it says, in the very heavens, I will do it. She took the Bible, the plane stopped in Cleveland, she left, and I went on to Rochester with rejoicing in my heart. As a brother, 
He was one of seven children with four brothers, two sisters. His oldest brother, Clarence, brought my mother on Christmas Day, just a few hours after he died, a beautiful poem. It's printed in the insert. He was a loving and a faithful brother. But my dad was not perfect, even as a brother. One of the great stories, he had so many wonderful stories of his childhood that we found. Well, let me let you, I'm gonna let him tell you this one. One day an old lady asked us to pick cherries. She had two trees next to each other. I was to pick cherries in one tree and my brother Richard in the other. She told us we were not to eat any cherries while in that tree. She would count them out and give us each half of what we picked. You know those black cherries seem to grow brighter the higher that we climbed. The temptation was too high, too much. When she wasn't looking, I would eat a few and throw the pits under Richard's tree. <laughs> Soon she became aware of pits falling from the tree in which my brother was picking. I can still remember her voice saying, Richard, come down from my tree. Richard came down quickly. She divided out his cherries and then discharged him. I continued to pick cherries, but to be sure, under her watchful eye, I did not eat any more. My younger brother never quite realized why he was fired. <laughs> As a father, I've lived most of my adult life in California, but anyone who knows me knows that my dad was one of a kind. I always tell two little stories, and then they always understand why my dad was so special. This is my own story. When I was small, I wanted to be a bus driver, and I practiced many, many hours in my little go-kart going around the neighborhood. My dad decided that he would buy me a used bus from the Rochester Transit Company and park it in the backyard at 39 Culver Parkway so I could really feel like a real bus driver. Now, the only big argument I can ever remember between my mom and dad was over that bus being parked at 39 Culver Parkway. You know, it never did arrive, so I think my mom probably won that argument. Every morning when we were young, my mom would get up to fix breakfast, and Don and I would get into bed with my dad for a never-ending story that seemed to go on for years. My dad remembers it this way. I remember happy times and telling imaginary stories to the children. Sometimes I got so interested in the stories that I could hardly wait until the next morning when they would crawl into bed with me. How we love to feed the birds. As I pretended to put bird feet in their hands and raise them up on my feet until they nearly touched the ceiling. What fun it was to watch them scatter the imaginary seed to the imaginary birds. One favorite story originated from the saying, I stuck a pin in the wall and that's all. But in our story, it was not all, for we pretended to peek through the little hole to see a golden pathway. A fairy gave us some pills. The pill would make us small. So we entered the pinhole and arrived at the golden castle. Sometimes in your stories, you travel very far to find the treasure is at home. Stored up in the memory of having such happy, loving times, with your children. There's so much more, but I'll close by saying that <coughs> some very tough times in my life brought me home to 226 Inwood Drive this September. What a blessing it's been to be with my dad every day since then, especially these last two weeks when he was struggling to stay with us. What a blessing to make him, what a blessing I should say for me to make up for some lost time, to show him how much he meant to me to comfort him to soothe him like he did so many times for me. You know, he was still an example right up to the end, an example of courage, an example of dignity, and yes, still even had a good sense of humor. On Christmas Eve, he struggled up the stairs. Don was there with me. And after he was in bed, I went back down to watch TV. I watched the movie Mix Scrooge with Bill Murray, a very unlikely place to get a beautiful thought for Christmas, but I did get one. For a couple of hours, every Christmas or every year, we laugh a little bit more, we share a little bit more, and we love a little bit more. We are the people we always hoped we would be. Not my dad. He was always that person. 
And as you know, my dad died on Christmas, which, you know, somehow seems right. He was every day, always will be for me, the spirit of Christmas.
the things that I spoke about were things I got from Gene, who was very helpful. Dr. Lillis says, stand up, stand up for Jesus. And we never sat in this one. <laughs> Today we're gathered to celebrate the life of Brother Gene Elhart, and in the Gideons I knew him as a brother. Gene, as we say in the Gideons, was a number one Gideon, something he was encouraged to become when he joined the Gideons International in 1971. Gene often was asked to speak to the various camps around the Rochester area about our seven spiritual objectives. These spiritual objectives are something that he lived out in his life. The objectives are that Gideons are to be men of the book, to be men of prayer, to be men of faith, men of a separated walk, men who witness, men of compassionate heart, and men who give. Brother Dean, Gene, as I said, did more than just speak to us of these qualities, of these objectives. He modeled them to us and to his family and to all of you in his life. He was a great blessing to the Gideons International. And I was thinking back over his time with us and uh, how he blessed me as I was a member of the Gideons uh, shortly after he became one. Gene did what the scriptures tell us. He hid God's word in his heart so that when he got old, he would not sin against him. When we gathered every Saturday morning for prayer, and there was a prayer we'd every day we'd be meeting, it would be a different day of the week, and we'd have different prayer requests in each a uh, prayer request for our international officers and our state officers had a scripture reference. And most of us would have to thumb through our Bibles and look it up, but Gene had God's word hidden in his heart, and he knew from uh, the moment uh, the scripture verse was announced what it was, and when we got lazy and we didn't want to turn in our Bibles to the scripture reference, Gene had it already and was able to uh, announce it for us. Gene was our chaplain on many occasions over those years, and he always encouraged us in scripture reading and prayer. And he was not ashamed of the gospel. As you know, uh, Gideons were out uh, in the, on the streets passing out Bibles, or in hospitals and hotels and motels, and especially around the, the sidewalks of the schools. Uh, and I can recall two occasions that I thought that I ought to share today. Uh, one occasion, and this is probably something maybe Mrs. Alhart doesn't even know, but. We were over at Fairport at the uh, Minerva DeLand School, and we were having a school distribution. And all of a sudden, we looked around and saw that Gene wasn't there, and noticed that he was in the back seat of a police car, and invited him into the police car to explain what we were doing there. And pretty soon, he exonerated himself. He would uh, witnessed to the police officers, given them a testament, and they'd let him out. And we were back on duty, passing out scriptures to the kids. On another occasion, I can recall at Monroe Middle School, uh, it was a day when they had some trouble there in the school. Uh, uh, we were approached by some police officers and some school personnel that we shouldn't stand on the sidewalk by the school. 
and that we should go across the street because there had been a couple knife fights earlier in the day. But, uh, there was some gang troubles going on. And that day we did not pass out many Bibles, but there was one troubled youth whose friend uh, was uh, injured in one of the knife fights. And he saw us over there, saw the, the scriptures being distributed, walked across the school before he got on his bus and started talking with Gene. And Brother Gene was able to take him aside and read the scriptures to him and lead him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that day, that youth went home calmed, knowing that the Lord Jesus was with him and in his heart and was able to take care of all his fears. As I mentioned, Gene was an A number one Gideon. He was an example to all of us, and he will be remembered fondly. And hopefully, we will follow the example he set in his life as we try to succeed him and carry on as he would have us to do. Thank you. Uh, the first time that I spoke at the at a pulpit in a church uh, was when I was making my confirmation uh, into church, and at length I talked about my grandfather um, because he's played such a major role in me affirming my faith to God. And I'd like to share with you two scriptures of his uh, that were favorites of his. The first is from the book of Philippians, uh, chapter four, verse thirteen, for verse thirteen rather. You think I know 13 by now. Uh, it's a favorite verse of Christian Endeavor friend Hilda Applebaum. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. The second uh, is from the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 40, verse 31. Uh, Grandpa left a Bible verse on our family voicemail every day. One day, from his bed in the hospital, he called and noted that this was his favorite verse. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Thank you. Grandpa was baptized in 1905, and at the age of 16 made his confession in this church on February 13, 1921. It was then the Second Reformed Church at Sio and Lindhurst Streets. Years later, at a Christian Endeavor camp, he opened his Bible at 10.17 a.m. and was drawn to Romans 10.17. So faith comes by what is heard, and what is heard comes by the preaching of Christ. I'm going to be uh, sharing Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 14 and 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The scriptures we've just shared talk of faith, and that one word seems to engulf my dad's life. In simple terms, faith is knowing that things will work out all right. Throughout his life, he could point to any situation and show you how sometimes ultimately, we had to wait once in a while, but ultimately things would work out all right. Dad was a track star at the U of R. His writings show his fear of the shaggy gang. And that made him run a little faster as a youth, preparing him for that track team. He loved to run. He would always write down the miles he ran and took great pride in his 1,000 and 10,000 mile status at the YMCA. He would do push-ups every morning. In fact, at age 88 or 89, uh, I can't recall exactly, but he would challenge a young teen at the State School of Industry to a push-up contest, and Dad would win. <laughs> Chin-ups, too, taught by his father and practiced on the clothing racks in the tailor shop. A chin-up saved his life while working in the shipyards. It happened as he walked the gangplank and was tossed as the wind shifted between the ship and the wall. And he writes, 
My hand caught the strip, which I didn't know was there. And with one hand, I pulled myself into the boat just as the wind shifted and the tanker crushed against the steel cripping. What a scare. And then he quotes 1 Timothy 4.8, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. And he adds, Physical exercise meant a lot to me. It saved my physical life. Godliness, exercising God's will in my life, means a lot more. It saves my spiritual life. Through faith, everything worked out all right. My dad never approved of alcohol, and that presented a challenge when it was his turn to host the monthly Rotary Board meeting. You see, he had just launched the ABC program. No alcohol, no beer, no cocktails. And he writes, in the 60s, Elwood Voller, who was president of the Rochester Rotary Club, and I held a board meeting at the YMCA without cocktails, but with a great selection of hors d'oeuvres. Needless to say, he writes, this was the one and only such board meeting. <laughs> It would take three decades, but he would see a time where alcohol was no longer a priority. In fact, he would take pride in Rotary's community efforts to support programs that fight drug and alcohol abuse. Through faith, it would work out all right. Rotary was a cornerstone in his life, 48 years of perfect attendance, and only one meeting missed each of the first seven years when we vacationed in the Adirondacks. He loved and cherished the fellowship, especially around the coffee table on Tuesdays, where he would not have to pay for a full luncheon ticket when he sat there. <laughs> he writes and talks fondly of the memories of the Sunshine Camp and what the store was able to do for him in terms of taking ice cream machines out there and making custard for the campers and going down to the state school in industry years before his push-up challenge for their annual Christmas party. And my grandfather, Georgie, would play the piano. Doing all of that, not as a chore or something that had to be done because he was in Rotary, but like the Arbor Hill nursing homes, and I always got a kick out of that as he approached 90 years old, he, he was doing that for the old people at the nursing home. And I think most in the audience were younger, but he did it because it was a serious and wonderful task. He would often tell of putting his choice of a lifelong mate in God's hands. He discovered my mother through his dedication to Christian endeavor, and his writings show this one organization has, and I quote him, been the core of my life. He says his prayer was answered, and he writes, my reward was a pretty little dimpled girl playing at the piano at a Christian Endeavor meeting at the Lake Avenue Baptist Church. Lois Ruth Cannon has become my faithful, loyal, devoted wife. You've heard the scripture, Romans 10, 17, from the Christian Endeavor camp. And he adds, we grow in faith from fellowship with Christian friends. By hearing God speak through Christian leaders and by listening to the still, small voice that speaks to us when you and I take time to listen. And as with Rotary, church attendance was very important to him. Marvin Sloan talked about those long car rides. I can remember one Sunday many years ago in a car on a Sunday morning when he and Christian Endeavor friends and I was there were traveling. They couldn't get to church. They held the service in the car. We sang hymns. They prayed. They had a sermon. I kept wondering if a trooper ever pulled us over, how he would explain what was going on there. <laughs> but through faith, everything worked out all right. Things often worked out all right in amusing ways. Now, I mentioned his faith in finding mom, but before meeting her, he shares the story, one of our favorites, of a young girl who pursued him at the U of R. After failing to get his attention at school, she came, where else, but to a Christian Endeavor meeting at the Brighton Reformed Church. And he writes, she made the impression that I was her boyfriend. She expected and trusted that I would take her home after the meeting. What to do? Though it was never my practice to go to the men's room, I thought it would be a good way to escape. She waited at the door for some time, but I never came out. A good friend of mine helped me climb out the window and escape. 
Could you believe it, he writes? The next morning in the engineering building, she came to me and said, what happened to you last night? You mysteriously disappeared. Brother Richard borrows a car with bad brakes, smashes into a tree on Field Street. Dad runs back to the scene with Rich, who is banged and bruised, and he writes, since my brother was underage, I gave the impression that I was the one who was driving the car. Things were proceeding nicely, and the cops were about to leave when a little boy came up to me and said, you weren't the driver of that car. And as he was about to tell the police, I said to him, shaking my fist in his face, do you want a punch in the nose? <laughs> He quickly ran away, the crowd left, and I left as the lucky driver that didn't get hurt. Perhaps not the right use of faith, but everything worked out all right. <laughs> and you know, it truly did. Trips to the Adirondacks, I can still remember the phone calls, worrying if we could find a place to stay, whether we'd be able to get a boat with a motor on it, because we never called ahead. Not to worry, it seemed to work out all right. No burglar alarms at home, I'm not sure that's a wise one, but he said, Muzzy, don't worry about it. He brought us up with a faith to let God handle our lives and take our lead from what is right, and it will be right. Now, that left only one problem for us. It's easy to look back and see where everything has turned out all right. But what about looking ahead? While living, we can only have faith in everlasting life. So what better way to answer that question than by making the transition on Christmas Day. My brother's words are forever impressed on my mind as he called me to tell me what happened Christmas morning. And he said, it's Christmas, and somehow it doesn't seem so bad. Many times this week, someone would say to me, sorry to hear you lost your dad, especially on Christmas Day. And as this week wore on, and as we looked through all of the writings, I began to realize everything worked out all right. I didn't lose him on Christmas. That's the day I found him. That reminds me of something we've been talking about, uh, how the uh, police got involved every little while. And I'm going to tell you that, uh, oh, I don't know how many years ago, there were nine carloads young people, including us, we went to a convention down in Middletown, New York, and uh, eight of our cars left me a church here. Gene had to pick up some people on the west side of the city, so we stopped all along just two minutes. So the eight cars of us, we were down the wrong hill, kind of a long hill going out there, and the truck very nice to go to the side, and all of us passed by the truck at the top of the hill. There was a state trooper waving each one of the soldiers, and we went over the double line. So eight of us were fine for two minutes. So while we're all lined up, uh, all this stuff, all of a sudden Gene goes off and they're all waited fine. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got home, and the night that we got home, Gene called and said, guess what? He said, I would stop your speeding on the way back. You had to pay $50. <laughs> so every one of us had something. So that's our, that's our relationship. Or we're going to take you all the hands, and I'm very really happy that Lord's going to play for us. That's how they say. Okay. Bear with me. I may swear to bad no, I do in the nursing home. <laughs> <laughs>
hole. In one of my grandfather's writings, he states that one of his greatest possessions is God's love. As a reminder to him, he repeated the 13th chapter of Corinthians every day in his mind. To me, my grandpa was the epitome of love and a great inspiration in my life, so much that the love chapter was the one I'd like to share with you today. You can tell by this scripture reading how strongly he lived by God's message to us. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love inspires us to give others room to grow out of their shortcomings and sins. Love is kind. Christ said, go and sin no more with a kindness that inspired others to live better lives. It does not envy. God calls us to appreciate our blessings and to be joyful about the good fortunes of other people. It does not boast. Since we come to God from the shadow of the cross, we shouldn't be impressed with ourselves. It is not proud. Differences in talent, intellect, or wealth don't matter when God is in the picture. It is not rude. Valuing the feelings of others show respect. It is not self-seeking. 
God wants us to focus on the never-ending debt that we have to other people to love them. It is not easily angered. Venting exasperation is an ugly indulgence of self. It keeps no records of wrongs. God obliterates our sins. We should quit collecting them. Love does not delight in evil. God covers sin. We should do likewise. But rejoices in the truth. God forgave us our sins, and he gave us his spirit to enable Christ to live actively in us. It always protects. God protects us, so sh we should also protect our relationships. It always trusts. Even if a person has deep problems, we can hate the sin and love the sinner. And that's what God did for us. Love always hopes. God sees us in the light of what we can be. His grace and enabling spirit give us hope. It always perseveres. Our love for others from God can be unconquerable. No matter what others do, love continues unchanged. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. I love you, Grandpa, and your vivid memory will remain strongly and firmly forever in my heart with all my love, Susie B. I'm Gene Alhard's son-in-law. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him the last few years. Dave was in uh, California. Don is busy, as you all know, in many, many things. And we would go out many times to restaurants, just take a ride. He said, anything Muzzy wants, yes, that's good with me. I spent three hours with him on Christmas Eve. He really didn't want to watch the football games. He, he didn't tell me that. Muzzy told me that later. And so we turned the channel over to the greatest story ever told. And he, was, he had gotten to the habit of sort of dozing as the TV was on. But this night, he didn't doze. He watched very carefully. We got to the part of the Last Supper. And I said, Gene, I, I really forget the names of the disciples. Bet you not many of you can name them, as a matter of fact. And he started rattling them off it, through a rhyme that he had learned many, many years ago. I'm not going to do it now, because I've already forgotten it. But he was sharp right up to the end. And he knew the Bible inside out, much of it by memory. But I'm here to tell you a little bit about his garden. About. Uh, March, April time, he would get out his little piece of scratch paper and he'd lay out his whole garden. But he wouldn't buy anything until April because he knew that because his birthday was late March, he'd get a gift certificate, one of the f family, and <laughs> would give him some money to buy the seeds and the fertilizer that he needed. And then if there were some nice days in March and April, he'd uh, get out and spade the whole garden by hand. It was 2,100 square feet of garden. That was a lot of spading to do. But he loved the work. He loved the physical exercises, as you've heard Don talk about. I'm not going to tell you about all the kinds of fruits and vegetables and problems he had with the raccoons and the squirrels and the rabbits and the crows that sort of were his enemies at the time. I just want to tell you a couple of little incidences. When he was at the store, he'd come home uh, for his lunch break, but he wouldn't really have it at lunchtime. He'd come back sort of in the afternoon. And he'd go right out into the garden. 
He had his best shoes on, his dress pants, his shirt and tie. And uh, Muzzy really didn't like that too much because she had to do all the cleaning up afterwards. And I asked him why he did that. And he said, well, if you want a good job done, you've got to dress for it. <laughs> In the last few years, he had a little more trouble in, in the garden. Uh, this last year, in fact, uh, the family helped him out. And uh, Don would be out in the garden, uh, our son Don, uh, the, the Don Alhart you know is, uh, probably wouldn't be in the gardens and digging and spading. <laughs> And Gene would laboriously uh, walk down the incline back to the garden, and he wanted to make sure that Don was planting those rows right straight, that the seeds were the right depth and the right distance apart. And even up to the end, he was wanting that garden to be perfect. He loved the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians that Sue just read. And he sort of applied it to his garden. He had faith that his seeds would grow. He had hope that he had done all the right things so that God could make the harvest come. And he had love for the whole work in the garden. And in fact, he had love that when the harvest came, a number of you here today received bags of beans or tomatoes. We did and I think the neighbors and other fr friends and relatives did as well. He said in his writings, just as you plant a seed to make it grow, the seed of faith must be nurtured to give assurance that you have new life in Christ. He loved his garden, so it's no surprise that one of his favorite songs is in the garden. to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he
This is usually the time in the service where the minister gets up and is called to proclaim the gospel in some form or fashion, to bear witness to the resurrection of Christ. Let's leave it at this today. Jean Alhart's life bore witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listening to Peter talk about the gardening stories and then your solo, Jennifer. When I baptize a child here at the font, when I meet with young people or adults preparing to make a profession of the Christian faith, I think a lot about my hopes for that child or young person or adult planting the seeds of faith in a life, what, will, what shape, what form will that new life take? What do I want my daughters to look like as they grow up? What do I want anyone to look like when they grow up as a Christian? What does it look like being a Christian? And the answer is I want them to look something like Jean Elhart. The gospel is all about the proclamation of God's love. Gene was shaped by that so much he did not take it for granted. We heard that he recited the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians every day. It wasn't just a ritual he went through. It was formative for him, shaped the person he was so that he could live those words out by action and will and deed. The Christian life is about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What does that look like? You've heard some of the stories today. It looks like Jean Elhart spending time with God in ways maybe none of us knew completely. Solitary time, Jean and his God, deliberately, with some spiritual discipline, attending to the well-being of his soul as carefully as a nutritionist attends to the needs of her body or an auto mechanic attends to the needs of his vehicle, he attended to the needs of his soul. And look at the result of it all. The gospel is about loving your neighbor as yourself. What does that look like? I mentioned to Don and Dave this week that my barber down in Panorama Plaza used to, grew up in the neighborhood where the Alharts used to live. And as a boy, he and his buddies used to get in the way sometimes down in front of Alharts store. And Gene knew how to handle all situations well. There wasn't anything that couldn't be handled without enough lollipops and firm, clear words. <laughs> Our being here is a testimony of what it means to love your neighbor. What is a Christian life about but to seek justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? He isn't with us anymore. But the world sorely needs now as much as ever men and women who will embody the life of faith the way Gene Alhart did. He was concerned about what was happening in the world and where the world was headed. 
even in these last days. The greatest legacy that he left and that we can act upon is to devote ourselves not to trying perhaps to being just like Gene in every way, but to committing ourselves to represent the good news of the gospel in the kinds of people we are and the sort of lives we live. The world is filled with good people, and Jean had the ability to see that in people. Every once in a while, an extraordinary person comes along, and he was one of them. But there's no secret to what made him extraordinary. A heart for God, a life of integrity, which means that who he was in private was who he was in public, and they were one and the same. and a willingness to embrace grace, to know that the, in the end, it's all about grace. It's all about a gift from God simply waiting to be embraced, and he embraced it every day and then lived it to the fullest. How can we do any less? Amen. first. Mom is not quite uh, ready for this, but just going to take a minute, just going to take a minute, because my dad, we haven't said too much about where he spent over 50 percent of his time, and that was at his business, Al Hart's. I see Bob out there. Is that? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Gosh, I'm sorry. I thought that looked like Bob. Sorry. That business and his success, and my mom's support of my dad, those long hours he put in at Al Hart's, without the success of Al Hart's, he could not have been as an effective a witness for the Gideons, for Rotary, for the Sunshine Camp, for Lake Avenue, for Trinity. He and his brothers worked together in that business, and the grandchildren, the children, all remember many great times at Al Hart's. He was very proud that he and his brothers had done one of the very first singing commercials on radio or TV. I asked the Reverend if it would be irreverent, because he said yes, but we're going to do it anyway. I asked my mom if she would mind. She said, I don't want, I don't, but we're going to do it anyway. Because this song, in its own way, is just as much a part of his life. We heard it all the time as any of the hymns that we sang. Now, we were hoping his brothers could be here. Unfortunately, both Bob and Clarence, his only two remaining brothers, are not here today. But in their honor and in my dad's honor, if Don, if you'll start it off, we'll you do it. the other two brothers were here, my son. <laughs> <laughs> you should be going, going down, down. You, you should, should be going, going down. Going down, going down to Al Hart's here in town to buy a Calvinator, which is the best. A five-year guarantee goes with the rest. Small payment down, small payment down. Three years or less in which to pay. Don't you think that it is time you gave up the ice man's dime? Calvinator's Al Hart's line. That's all you. There's not much left to me to, for me to say with these. <laughs> I just want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank you for the many thoughts and prayers that have been with our family through this last month of trying times. But I would like to share with you <clears throat> the one thing that I have never seen Jean do on Christmas Eve morning. I have never once seen him witness for the Lord in the way which I did. He had two beautiful Catholic nurses. The one who came Saturday morning was just as, fell just as much in love with him as the other one. He stood, 
he was in his chair. He came down Christmas Eve morning. I didn't think he should, but he came down. We got him ready, and he came down. The nurse came. She finished what she was doing with him. He had two little Gideon Bibles up on his, his stand there, and I thought, my, what does he have two of those down here for? But he reached as she was, had her bags all packed, all ready to go, and this girl was only 28 years old. And he reached up, and he took his little Bible down, and he said, would you read the 13th chapter of Corinthians with me? She took the Bible, the Little Testament, she read, and he recited it by heart. And that, to me, was the last time I had seen him witness, and the first time that I had seen him pass out a Gideon Bible and witness for his Lord, for which I was very thankful. I was pleased when Dick asked me to do a prayer of thanksgiving with you today because the friendship that started with Lois those many years ago at Lake Avenue Baptist Church has extended to our church over the years. And a few weeks ago, I had a chance to have a prayer with Gene in the hospital. It was about a day after he'd been in a place where he couldn't really speak and he wasn't too sure of where he was, and so I was amazed and pleased to come into the hospital and see him sitting up and uh, able to, to talk. And we joined hands and we prayed, and I prayed for a while, and then Gene prayed, and he gave thanks in his prayer, and he gave thanks for his friends. He gave thanks for his friends, especially in two churches, and he gave thanks for his other friends and for the sense of being borne up by them. And so, as I pray today, I would ask you to have a sense that you share in my holding the hand of Gene Elhart that day. And if you're comfortable and want to join hands with somebody next to you, you're welcome to do that as we all join hands in the company of saints with Gene Elhart. Holy God, Heavenly Father, you are our sustaining spirit. You are our life. You are our light. We thank you for the gift of the life of Eugene Alhart. We thank you for giving him to be with us for a little while, to know and to love. We're grateful for his witness and for the love and respect he showed not only his family and his neighbors, but strangers as well. We thank you for a person who served willingly, gave so thoughtfully of himself. We thank you for the gifts of renewed life and most of all, strength and faith given to so many in this room and beyond it through your child, Gene. We know that he is beloved of you we know that he is in your caring presence. We ask now that you sustain and nurture us as we face loneliness and grief. We acknowledge the ways we've come to depend on Gene. We confess to our common sorrow at separation, even as we acknowledge our joy that he needs struggle no more. Be present to us Comfort your children. In your compassion, O oh God, give us deeper faith so that we might have a more certain, clear vision of that in our lives which cannot be taken away because we're held safe 
in your loving arms. Give us the strength and confidence which we need to go on in our course in life until we're made one with all who've gone on before us. O oh God, fill us to overflowing with your love in Jesus Christ so we may feel united in that love with Jean and with all who've gone on before us and so that we might be so full of that love that we would continue his witness, that we would live it out as he lived it out. Lord, we know that with you, death is not forever. We ask you to help us nonetheless as we try to deal with separation. Heal us, hold us now, and in the days to come, until we are brought together in unity in your kingdom, which is in heaven as it is on earth. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's now join and stand for our closing hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. He had many of them, and we will close with another such passage. Seems quite fitting. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is need, named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the might of his spirit in the inner person, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to him who by power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. To him be all honor and glory and power in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, now and forevermore. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>
you saw these pictures in a bright spot we shared in March of this year when my dad celebrated his 90th birthday. You may even remember his challenge to parents from the Bible. Well, everybody that comes up to me, oh, are, are you Don's dad? I said, yes, I'm his dad, all right. I said, well, if you just say to Don, Proverbs 226, he's got the answer. I've got it too, but he has it. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so when I look at the group here and the children and the grandchildren that are, that are growing up, it's a wonderful thrill to know that they're being trained by good parents. My dad has been an example to follow. And for those who knew him through the work of the Rotary Club, the church, or his appearances on our Easter Seals telethon with my mom, I simply want to share what a bright spot he has always been and will always be. As I said nine months ago, thanks, Dad, for being there to hold me up.